most people have not thought about their own views, but to just get them thinking and move them closer to Christ by removing an objection. When you get into these circumstances, sometimes it gets a little messy. What caused the universe to come into existence? And I'll make it easy on you. There's only two options, something or nothing. You know, with magic, you've got uh, a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. But in this case, you got no magician and you got no hat. You just right. got the rabbit. And having a friendly conversation that gets them thinking puts a rock in their shoe. In this video, we are going to give you a strategy, a clear proven technique on how you as a Christian can answer and discuss and defend some of the most difficult questions that many skeptics, many unbelievers, many atheists have as it relates to Christianity. And today, guys, I am here joined with my friend and brother, Greg Kokel, who has a new book out called Street Smarts. He is also the author of a great other book called Tactics. You're going to want to pick both of these up, guys. But listen, as you all know by now, the focus of this channel is not just to sell books and promote books and those types of things. The focus is to equip you, to empower you with the things that you need in order for you to be a more prepared, a well-seasoned Christian. And so today, guys, um, Greg has a different approach to apologetics. He's got a different perspective on how we as Christians should go about defending and discussing issues as it relates to our faith. And so, Greg, I'm going to start off with this question. So, guys, basically what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Greg a couple of questions as it relates to his strategy, his method. And then a little bit later in this video, we're going to stay here because we're going to do some role playing and I'm going to ask him some very specific questions. I'm going to be the skeptic. He's going to be the Christian or at times he might be the Christian and the skeptic. And we'll see how that goes. But he's going to really demonstrate for us how to uh, utilize his strategy. So, Greg, it's no secret that many Christians and even myself included at times, we feel ill equipped. We feel yeah. uncomfortable. We start to get nervous. We feel a little bit intimidated when people start to ask us questions that we aren't prepared for as it relates to our Christian faith. So if you could just take a little bit of time, as much time as you need, to tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about your strategy for apologetics and how you recommend we as Christians discuss our faith with those who believe something different. Than well, that. Alan, I, I've been a Christian, just had my spiritual birthday like 50 years ago was when I became a Christian. It was my spiritual birthday. It was just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I've been in like over 90 different college and university campuses and done street work and all kinds of stuff. And I know this is the hardest time for Christians to engage the public with their point of view, because everybody seems to be against them from top to bottom, schools, education, government, uh, the media, everything, okay? And people are really hostile right now. And I learned something over those 50 years of work, and it really started coming clear to me at about, about maybe 20 years ago, little by little by little, and this is why I wrote the book Tactics, that the way that we've been approaching evangelism is not the same way that the New Testament folks approached evangelism. Um, we are scared. We don't have a New Testament approach to evangelism and we don't have a plan. And this is one of the, the these are three of the reasons actually that people have a hard time out there. Now, the reason I wrote the books titled it uh, Street Smarts is because the street is the place where you feel vulnerable. It's wherever you feel like you're under attack, that you're, you, you know, that you could get hurt in conversations. All right. And that could be with family. That could be with uh, at work. That could be with other students. It, I mean, it could be a lot of circumstances. Right. And so consequently, we don't speak out. We just stay on the bench. All right. And what I've discovered is, first of all, being frightened and scared of out there is not surprising. The disciples were were the same way. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is sending the disciples out in their first missionary journey. And three times in seven sentences, he says, do not fear. I mean, the great apostle Paul in Acts 18 had Jesus had to appear to him <laughs> to tell him, don't be afraid any longer. Speak out, Paul. I have many people in the city. That was Corinth. Okay, so it's understandable that people would be nervous, that they would be frightened. All right. But uh, Jesus said, there were two things that I want you to notice in Matthew 10. First, Jesus said, uh, you have the Holy Spirit to help you. Okay, that's great. But he didn't say that at the beginning of his ministry. He was well into the time of training 
before he mentioned the Holy Spirit. At the beginning of his ministry, he said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So there is a, a, a an educational process that the Holy Spirit uses to help us when we're engaging in scary circumstances. And that's why I put together Street Smarts, okay? Now I mentioned that most people um, don't understand the New Testament means of evangelism, okay? Uh, you'll be surprised to know, many will be, that there are no altar calls in the New Testament. Nobody is challenged to pray to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. It isn't there. This is kind of a new thing, 150 years or less, that uh, this has been part of our culture, okay? And um, what they did is something different, okay? And this is something I noticed in John chapter 4, and Jesus makes a comment to the disciples there after the woman at the well, right? You remember that famous uh, conversation he had. Afterwards, he tells the disciples, you are about to reap where you did not sow. You were about to reap where you did not sow. In other words, uh, somebody else did the heavy lifting, they're gonna get the easy pickings, right? And uh, um, and then he talks about sowing and reaping to them, all right? Now, this is a very important concept that a lot of people miss, Alan, because um, they th what we have now are reaping tools. You got that little tract with the little prayer at the end? Okay, that's yeah. to go out and help to get people to pray to receive Christ. Now, I'm not against that, but um, I just want you to notice that's a reaping tool, all right? And here's the thing that really transformed my own thinking when it began to sink into me. Before you can have a harvest, you always have to have a season, and let's just call it gardening. Okay, let me say it again, because it's so important. Before you have a harvest, you have to have a season of gardening, okay? Now, um, and the thing about the harvest, and this is what Jesus was communicating to the disciples then, is that the harvest is easy when the fruit is ripe. Right. 50 years ago, and I became a Christian, I don't know what it was for you, Alan. I don't know if you were raised a Christian or you became Christian later in life. I was 23. And my younger brother, Mark, was the guy who did most of the gardening in my life. But the night he came to, to my apartment, September 28th, 1973, he started telling me more about Jesus. And I said, Mark, you don't have to tell me any more about Jesus. I already decided I want to become a Christian. Yeah. In other words, I harvested myself. Yeah. The fruit was ripe. You bump into it and it falls into the basket. You know, you go around places where there's apple orchards in the fall, like now, where are all the ripe apples? They're on the ground. Yeah. They harvest themselves. They fall in. And so the point here is um, the harvest is easy if the gardening is done. And so I have developed an idea here with tactics and then Street Smarts, which is kind of a, a sequel to tactics, okay? It follows up on the tactical game plan, which we'll get into in a few moments. But the, uh, the, a game plan, uh, an approach that will allow people to garden effectively. And this is going to sound strange. I tell people, don't worry about the harvest. Don't worry about trying to pull on that fruit and get it in the basket. It's going to fall in there when the gardening is done properly. In fact, I haven't, people are surprised for me to say this, but I haven't prayed with anyone to receive Christ in 30 years. Yeah. But I have never been as effective as I have been in the last 30 years because of understanding the gardening concept. Now, I know that's freaky to people, but um, you know Jay Warner Wallace, is that right? I don't know yeah, if you yeah. have one. No, I, yeah. I know him well, He's yes. the great Gold case, cold case detective who was an atheist who became a Christian then wrote a bunch of books and he's a fabulous uh, a fabulous apologist and most many of your listeners probably know him if they don't they should get his book cold case Christianity however what most people don't know about Jay Warner Wallace is that when he was an atheist he was in my garden he was somebody listening to our radio show and listening to uh, reading our material and stuff like that now I didn't lead him to Christ Someone else did that. <clears throat> Actually, I don't even know how he became a Christian. I just right. know he has one now. But uh, somebody else was more fundamental in making him making that decision. But um, basically what happened is somebody went into my garden <laughs> and they harvested my crop. Yeah. Greg, I want to make a point about that because sure. you know, I think many Christians, we feel this pressure to be like a, a salesman where, you know, hey, I'm not going to get a commission unless I close the deal, right? right? And so I've got this pressure as a salesman that mm -hmm. I've got to make sure that you buy a car from me, right? Whereas it's a different approach. If I'm a salesman and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get a commission or our company is going to get rewarded as long as this person buys a car, period, right? right. And so all I need to do is do my best to educate them as much as possible on the car 
and how this car can be a, a great asset for them and their family. And whether they buy now, a year from now, five years from now, our company is going to win because I've spent the last two hours telling them how great this car is. But then when they are ready to buy the car, they could go to another dealership and the other guy might try to do the exact same thing I am. And they're like, look, I don't need that spiel. I don't need all that. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. I know the car. Right. This is the car I want. Here's my money. Here's a credit card. And the salesman's like, whoa, that was pretty easy, right? It's yeah. because all the work has been done on the front end. So I love your per approach about taking the pressure off. We don't have to close the deal. It's about, as you say, putting a uh, a stone or a pebble, should I say, in people's That's right. shoes. Actually, I don't want to put a pebble that's too small. I want to put a stone in their shoe. And I'm glad you mentioned that. By the way, the illustration is a great one. I've never used it before, but it's perfect for the circumstance. It isn't like we only get credit when we close the deal. We are out there as ambassadors for Christ. We are to do what we can do with the circumstances that God gives us. And I'll give some strategies on how to do that most effectively. But we don't have to worry about closing the deal. God is the one who does that. That's on yeah. his side of the ledger. It's not on our side of the ledger. And what I'm trying to do with my game plan, with my gardening game plan, is to do just what you mentioned, put a stone in their shoe. Now, I tell that to audiences whenever I start, secular audiences at the University of Kentucky a couple of months ago, and I just told them, I said, look it, I'm not here to convert you. I just want to annoy you in a good way. <laughs> yeah. I just want to put a stone in your shoe. Now, they all expect the Christian to annoy them, you know, so I said, okay, I'm your guy, but I hope you're going to thank me when we're done. I want you walking out of this auditorium mm -hmm. with something that I've said sticking at you. And if I can do that, and that's not just in a public speaking circumstance, but even talking to a waitress or somebody next to me on an airplane, if I can just give them something good to think about um, it, that's gnawing at them, that maybe maybe is in favor of my view, or maybe is a flaw that they hadn't considered in their view, Didn't that's a thinking. step along the way. And you yeah. probably found out too, Alan, when you're sharing with people, um, it, nobody changes their mind instantly on something like this. Correct. Or they shouldn't be doing that because they don't understand what's going on if they do. No, this takes a long time. People get a little here, a little there, a little here, a little there, and then they're ripe for the harvest. And God yeah. is the one who's responsible for that. But we can all participate if we have a game plan that allows us to move forward effectively. So speaking of that game plan, tell us, tell us what is your tactical game plan? Give us the three steps the questions specifically that you recommend we as Christians focus our conversation on so that we can be in the driver's seat and not feel so intimidated and uncomfortable in these conversations. What what yeah. are those specific questions and what? Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned three steps. Okay. And, uh, and I, I pretty much got this whole approach using questions and this is the key to it all using questions to get people thinking and to make a difference and as you pointed out to to get in the driver's seat of the conversation i mean we think about our conversation right here um i'm doing all the heavy lifting but i'm going in the direction that you pointed me in alan because you're the one who's asking the questions so when you use questions questions are going to are going to put you in the driver's seat, help you to manage the conversation well, and they're also going to keep you safe. I mentioned street smarts. Uh, street, the street is where you feel vulnerable. The way to feel safe is by asking questions. Once you ask a question, the ball goes in the other side of the court. The other person has to respond. And it starts out very simply, the very first step of the game plan. In other words, the first thing that I want to encourage anyone to do when they find themselves in a circumstance that might have a spiritual impact on a person, I want them to simply gather information. Okay, that's key. That's it. That's the first step. Gather information. You got to get the lay of the land. You got to get intel. People are coming at you. They're pushing back with you. They're offering challenges to you. You need to know what the challenges amount to. You need to put the ball back in their court and get a little breather, a little breathing room and let them talk more. Okay, so somebody says, uh, so for example, what about the problem of evil? I say, what about it? <laughs> they say, well, uh, that's a problem for you, isn't it? I said, what's the problem? Now, I want them to spell it out for me. Notice I'm giving myself some breathing room. I'm not trying to be coy. I am trying to be shrewd. I'm not trying to avoid things, but I want them to talk. Okay, notice that the questions that I asked were some form of the question, what do you mean by that? And that's the key question here. Somebody says, 
gives you a challenge, you want to gather information, and you ask the question, what do you mean by that? Or some variation. So uh, somebody says the Bible's been changed. Can't trust the Bible. It's been changed. Really? How has it been changed? What's your understanding about that? Bang, back on their in their uh, their lap. Um, uh, a woman has a right to do whatever she wants to do with her own body. Anti-pro-life uh, view. All right. Pro-abortion. Okay. Tell me more. Explain that a little bit more to me. Now, I understand this is counterintuitive to a lot of people. All right. Because they think if the other person is talking more, they're going to make their case stronger against me. And I'm that puts me in a bad spot. Right. But here's the deal. And I want people to be thinking about this. If we have the truth and they are speaking contrary to our view, that means their view isn't true. And so the more I can get them talking about their false view the more likely it is that they are going to dig a hole for themselves that they're going to fall into if we know what to look for, okay? And this is part of the Street Smarts approach, knowing what to look for. So the first step is just to answer the question, or rather offer the question, what do you mean by that, as a way of gathering um, gathering information, getting intel, all right? But by the way, when I talk to audiences, this is, this is where I trick the audience, and I say to the church audience, I say, by the way, do you guys take the Bible literally? Here, this year, everybody raised their hand. Yeah, we do. I said, so you mean Jesus is a stick? What do you mean? John 15, I am the, I am the vine. You are the oh, branches. We're all sticks. No, right. he didn't mean it that way. Oh, what, what happened? What did, you, what did you miss here? What did you do wrong? When I said, do you take the Bible literally? You should have said, what? What do you mean by that? I could right. ask him, do you believe in evolution? Oh, no, we don't believe in evolution. You don't think things change over time? huh what did right. you what didn't you do you didn't ask the question what do you mean, by, you that? mean by that so those are two illustrations to show how important that question is and notice by the way alan when people say do you take the bible literally they're in attack mode because they're right. going to go to all kinds of crazy things in the bible they don't agree with when they say D do you believe in evolution they're in attack mode okay when you ask the question what do you mean by that? What do you mean by literal? What do you mean by evolution? You toss the ball back in that court, gives you breathing room, and it forces them to be more precise about their own view. This is really important. Now, I, can I give you a little anecdote of how that worked out in a powerful way? Sure, yeah. Yeah, that's just the first question, okay? Now, you need to know something, Alan, and I don't know, when we were with each other in August of, uh, or, or July, I guess it was, yeah. in CIA, I yeah. don't I don't know if I mentioned this at all, but I am not a morning person, okay? I'm I mean, before either. my first, okay, maybe you're like me before my first cup of coffee, I'm an atheist, right? I don't know about <laughs> you, but it takes me a while to get my theological stuff going. Okay, so I'm doing an event in Seattle, Washington, um, I worked all Friday night, all day Saturday, really hard. And Sunday morning, I got to preach at a church. And I'm in a restaurant, just coming out with my roller bag from the hotel, gra going to grab a little coffee, right? Because I don't want to talk about Jesus. I don't want to talk about God. I don't want to talk, okay? And this waitress comes up to me, and she was being much more <laughs> energetic <laughs> than I'm used to, and I could take at that time in the morning. Oh, huh, what are you doing here in Seattle this fine morning? That kind of thing. Oh, and I'm just thinking, go away. And I said, I, I thought I'll get rid of her. I I'm going to preach in a church. And then she says, oh, that's good. And I'm thinking, what does she mean that's good? Are you a Christian? I asked her that. She said, no, I'm not a Christian. I used to be a Christian, but I'm not. Now the universe takes care of me. And I'm thinking, what the heck? And right. so I asked her, I said, what do you mean the universe takes care of you? Is the universe a person? She said, no, it's not a person. Well, then how can the universe take care of you? And she said, oh, I guess God takes care of me. Oh, well, that makes sense. And God is the universe. I'm going, what does that mean? What, what is? And so I asked her these questions. Now notice, do I want to witness? No, I don't even want to talk. But I, she's saying these things that don't make sense to me. And my, you know, my, my game plan is running off automatically. I'm just trying to get clarification. Okay, here's the key to this. That conversation went on a little bit longer. And all I was doing is ask, asking questions to get clear on her view, which I wasn't able to do. She goes away. I get my coffee, get my scrambled eggs. And when she comes back to give me my bill, here's what she says to me. She says, Nobody has ever asked me questions about my view before. Mm. And then she said, and it got me thinking. And that's oh, my win. goodness. That's, a win. that's amazing. I wasn't that's even trying. In fact, I was trying not to witness. 
Right. But just the fact that I was gathering information from her about her view forced her to think more carefully about what her view was. Okay. And this is one of the powerful elements here, just in the first step of the game plan. You're getting information from them that's not only helping you to understand their view so you don't get it wrong, but it also helps them to understand their view. And I'm just telling you, Alan, this first step, if your listeners just practice this first step and become a student of somebody else's view for a couple of months, don't try to share the Lord, just find out what other people think. They're going to get an education and they're also going to realize that people don't haven't really thought through their views very well. Yeah. You're going to have an impact just with that first question. You, you know, so, and, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, say this because I think that that right there, what you just said has freed up a lot of Christians already just from point number one, which is, Hey, what do you mean by that? Um, can you explain what you mean by that? Because many of us feel like we have to be a seminary graduate. We have to be a, a, an, a, an apologist and we have to have all the answers. And sometimes when people come to us and they uh, have um, some sort of um, question or pushback with regards to our faith, what we naturally do is we launch into all of our arguments for right. the existence of God or for why, you know, uh, a, a woman should not be able to do this or that. With her, and we just launch out and launch out, launch out. And what you're saying is a completely opposite approach. Like there might be a time for that later in the conversation, maybe, right. <laughs> but start off by getting information from them and letting them kind of talk. And, and, and it's also giving you time to process things and how you might want to respond to it. And you're getting information and you're also letting them realize, wow, I hadn't really thought through this really well. So that's great. Number one, what is the that's right. second Okay, uh, the second one. And by the way, there is a place to come back with a refutation or a challenge to the other person's view or an answer to the challenge to your own view. Uh, but that's going to be the third step. And we're always going to use questions. So just an advance notice on that. OK, yeah. that's why the, the book is subtitled Street Smarts Using Questions to Answer Christianity's Toughest Challenges. OK, for, so in the first step, we now we know what the person thinks or what the nature of their challenge is as, as much as we can. And when they answer your questions, uh, what do you mean by that? And there's still some ambiguities. Go ahead and ask more questions about that. Try to get as full of understanding you can of their of their own view. OK, the second step is now that we know what they believe, we want to know why they believe that. OK, why they believe that. So we're going to use some form of the question. Now, how did you come to that conclusion? Now, how do, what, what are your reasons for that? Help me to understand why you think that's that's true. <clears throat> OK, again, this is a very easy question. Notice the Christian isn't advancing his view at, at this point. The, the Christian is just simply asking for more information. On the one hand, he wants to know what the view is. On the next hand, what are the reasons that the person has the view? So a person might say, well, the Bible's been changed. OK, you ask some questions about what they think that means. Textual criticism is the formal area. You don't need to know about that. <clears throat> I know about that. Apologists do, but you don't need to know. You just need to know what he thinks it is. All right. And then the next question is going to be, OK, now, why do you think that it got changed the way you said it got changed? What are your reasons for that? Now, in these first two questions, they're gathering various types of information, right? There's a strange response that I often get, Alan, when I ask either of these two questions and I warn people about it. OK, I get what I call the Simon and Garfunkel response. I mean, you probably know who those guys are, you know, but maybe your listeners don't. If they don't, they should because they're this, this is a 60s alert here. In 1966, they wrote this fabulous song called The Sounds of Silence. And sometimes when you ask a person, what do you mean by that? Or how did you come to that conclusion? Some variation of that. You get the sounds of silence. They don't know. You get dead air. And the reason is, and this is really important for your folks to understand, <clears throat> excuse me, is they, most people have not thought about their own views. They haven't considered the challenges to their view. They haven't thought about the reasons for it. They're just repeating what they've heard. Mm -hmm. And when you ask them, what do you mean by that? And what are your reasons for that? A lot of times they're stymied because they don't have any reasons for that. I've had people tell me I don't have any reasons for that. And I tell them, well, I got another question. What's that? Why would you believe something that you have no reasons to believe? And they said to me, well, I don't have any reasons for that either. Sometimes this could be funny. But by the way, this when I just kind of role played that back and forth, notice my my manner. 
I try to be very calm and relaxed and friendly and joking with people a little bit. I use their name as much as I can. This is a mellow conversation. I do right. not want to get in a fight with people. And then you lose. One of the, you, right. The, you, look, at if anybody gets mad, we're going to lose, right? Yeah. Okay? Because people aren't looking to be persuaded when they're angry or I'm angry or whatever. All right? And that's why the text says, share your faith, defend your faith with gentleness and reverence, right? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to ask this other question. Now, how did you come to that conclusion? And I don't know what they're going to say. A lot of times it's dead air, like I mentioned, but I want to listen to it. And as they are talking, I'm looking to get more clarification. Sometimes those reasons they give um, uh, cause me to ask this other question again. What do you mean by that? So all we're doing in the first two steps, and this is very simple, is we're gathering two different types of information, all right? And uh, much of your conversation can just be about that. Now think about this. The non-Christian expects the Christian to fight back. And instead of fighting back, what we're doing is we're letting them talk and we're drawing them out and getting more information. This is great. It's a great atmosphere. Okay. Now, here's the third step of the game plan. The third step of the game plan is to use questions to make a point. To use questions to make a point. Now, this is more complex because um, <clears throat> more advanced because you have to know what point you're going to make. And in our case, with Street Smarts, what we're going to do is either deflect a challenge that people have offered us about our own view, or we're going to call into question the uh, the view that they have, okay, and maybe point out a weakness in their view to get them thinking, once again, to put a stone in their shoe, not to get an altar call, not to get them to sign on the dotted line, like you said, but to just get them thinking and move them closer to Christ by removing an objection. So let me give you an example of how this works. Uh, by the way, in order to be able to do this, you need to know to do the street smarts approach uh, you need to know the the weakness of what they've offered, okay? That's the first thing. A lot of people studying apologetics get that, and then like you pointed out, Alan, they just jump in and offer all these thoughts, okay? Yeah. We're not going to do that. We're going to use the knowledge that we have, but we're going to use it by employing it with questions, all right? So in order to use the street smarts approach, you got to know what's wrong with the issue. And I spent a lot of time in the book on all kinds of topics, like you mentioned, atheism and the problem of evil and uh, abortion and problems in the Bible and problems with Jesus and sex, marriage and uh, gender and all those things. Here's the backstory. Here's the backstory, Christian. Here's how they challenge you. And here's what's wrong with that. So now you've got the backstory. And then I give dialogues with initial questions and follow-up questions to show how you can use the questions to exploit the problem. Which so I'm let's just- forward to you and I doing here in a little bit. Yeah. Say again? So I'm looking forward to you and I doing that here in a little bit where we're going <laughs> to okay. do some actual- And I'm going to point out, by the way, when, when you get into these circumstances, sometimes it gets a little messy because okay. uh, life is messy, but yep. that's okay. But let me give you an example okay. of how this might play out if you're talking- um, say to uh to an atheist who says well um there's no evidence for god okay there's no evidence for god i said do you mind if i ask you a few questions and actually i've had this conversation a number of times <clears throat> and one questioner at the university of toronto came to the mic and challenged me on this evidence for god i said do you mind if i ask you a few questions notice how i get permission up front very friendly no go ahead i said the first couple are going to be kind of simple um and then we'll get to the important one okay do you think that things exist Yes. <laughs> okay, good. I agree with you. Like I said, very simple. Uh, second, the things that exist, have they always existed? Are they eternal or did they come into existence? Now, nobody thinks that the universe is eternal anymore. hundred years ago, they did. Nobody does now. All the atheists believe in Big Bang cosmology. Now, I know Big Bang is controversial with some Christians, but don't worry about that. The important thing here is that both the Christian and the non-Christian believe the universe came into existence. That's all we need here. Okay. So, great. Big Bang cosmology. The universe isn't eternal, I tell the guy. Right. Um, I agree with you. Okay. It came into existence. Okay. Now, here's the last question, and this is the one that matters. What caused the universe to come into existence? And I'll make it easy on you. There's only two options, something or nothing. How about that? Something or nothing. So what say you? Now, of course, the atheist doesn't want to say something caused it because that's something outside of the material universe. He didn't like right. that one, right? That's got to be something that's pretty smart and pretty powerful and got to be a person to initiate the whole process of creation, if you will. That sounds too much like God to them. They don't want to go there. But what's their only other option? Nothing. 
Nothing, right? They have to say the universe came into existence with no cause for no purpose. And by the way, those two go together. If there's no cause, there's no purpose. You're left with a universe and life with no purpose. And you could you can make that point in your conversation maybe later on. I want to stick to this one thing, though. Uh, if he says nothing, which is what he wants to say, here's my point to him. Is that the odds on favorite? I'm not trying to prove God exists. What I'm trying to do is show that it's the smart money is on God. The smart money is on some one who caused the universe to come into existence. Okay. Uh, I mean, if he wants to say the universe popped into existence out of nothing, okay, fine. But that's worse than magic. You know, with magic, you've got uh, a magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. But in this case, you got no magician and you got no hat. You just right. got the rabbit, right? The universe coming into existence. So what I'm trying to do here is help this person see the, the group, the atheists who say they're the brights, they're the smart people that are following all the evidence, they're the reasonable, rational people, that what they're opting for at this point is a non-rational response. The smart money here is on God. And so now there's an example of using my questions in the third way to make a point that the evidence points to an intelligent creator. You don't have to believe in that if you want, but you're not going with the odds on favorite. You're not taking the rational response. One other thing I wanted to point out about that exchange, and this will be characteristic of all of the, the, the things that we talk about here, the examples that we explore, is that notice if I were just making the case as the apologist, well, you want evidence for God? Well, the universe, things exist, and they didn't always exist. The universe came into cosmological. You go, yeah, we got all things. that stuff. That's the cosmological <laughs> argument, yeah, and th that I'm offering. And then every time I make a step to lay a piece on the table, he's going to take ex exception with it, and we got an argument. He's not going to let me get going because he's a hostile witness, at least ideologically. He may be nice, but he's gonna, not going to let me get any motion forward. But in this case, because I'm asking the questions, I'm not the one putting these pieces on the table. It's the atheist who's putting the pieces on the table for me. Every time I ask a kind of a common sense question, he said he affirms it. He gives me an answer. And there's that piece on the table. Now, he is not going to take that piece off the table because he put it there. But he put it there because I asked the question. Yeah. And then we get to, in a sense, the mic drop moment, you know, and that's when, you know, uh, OK, something or nothing. Now, what's he going to do? He can't backtrack. He's not going to do that. Um, he's stuck with the real issue. And in every single case, the smart money is going to be on the Christian understanding of reality, whether it's a theological issue or whether it's a, uh, uh, an ethical issue or something like that. So uh, that's basically how the game plan works, the three parts, using questions to gather information, using questions to find out the reasons people have Rationality. for their view. I call it reversing the burden of proof. It's their job to prove their view. It's not my job to disprove it. And then finally, using questions, once again, to answer the challenges, to make a point. And that's the street smarts approach, having that understanding, knowing the questions that you'll use there, and then step by step working through the issue and having a friendly conversation that gets them thinking, puts a rock in their shoe. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, I believe you also rephrase it as, you know, understanding their rationale as well as a third step, I think, is exposing their flaws, right? You're trying, yeah, to, right. You're trying to really expose some of the flaws in their argument. Okay, so that was great. I love that. I love the fact that you laid it out so clearly. And guys, obviously, we only have about an hour in this conversation. So there is so much more that you're going to want to uh, dig into. Matter of fact, like I said, he, he talks about uh, different types of conversations and role plays and different things like that. But for the sake of argument for this particular uh, video, we're just going to pick maybe three or four. We'll see how much time we have, uh, okay. different questions. And I'll kind of, uh, be the skeptic for a little while. Greg will kind of chime in, uh, and, and, and we'll go from there. So Greg, um, um, my name is no longer Alan. My name is, uh, for this argument, I'll say my name is Jill. All right. And I am Jill, okay. a, I am a, I know I, the striking resemblance, right? I, I look like <laughs> no, a Jill, that, that works right? nowadays. Hey, hey, you know what? Hey, I, I identify as Jill, even though I'm a black man, I identify as Jill. Right. So, <laughs> Um, I, I am a woman and, um, I am pregnant and it's not really, you know, convenient for me at this point. Um, maybe I'm in college and I've got my whole life ahead of me. I got pregnant by someone that I'm not planning on marrying. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, 
um, I want to get an abortion. And um, so, you know, who are you as a Christian to tell me what I can and cannot do with my body when at the end of the day, whatever I do doesn't affect you in any way. So I should be able to do what I want with my body. Okay, Jill, just to be cl clear, are you saying that as a woman or as a human being, you have a right to do anything you want with your body? Yeah, I mean, exactly. I do. I mean, it's my body, my choice. I get to be okay, able to so do Okay, so uh, if you, let me just give you an example of something. If you say you had a two-year-old in your home and you wanted to go to the Bahamas, you left your two-year-old with a big bag of cereal and some milk and you went to the Bahamas for two weeks, would it be appropriate for you to say, I could do anything I want with my own body and therefore leave my two-year-old at home? No, because that would be harming my two-year-old. I mean, okay. obviously, that well, would not okay. be responsible. That wouldn't be responsible for me. Okay, good. Uh, so in other words, Jill, if I hear you right, um, you don't really think that you could do anything you want with your own body, right? There's some times where it's appropriate to put a restriction on what you do with your body. Is that right? Uh, I guess if you look at it that way with the example that you pointed out, Yes. Yeah, that sounded to me like that's but what you maybe, said. Maybe I should rephrase my question. I should be able to make any changes I would like to make with my own body. Maybe that would okay. be a better way of phrasing it. Okay. So, but in this circumstance, the change you're talking about is to terminate your pregnancy. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So when you terminate your pregnancy, what do you do? Um, I am basically um, deciding that um, I don't want to be a mom. And right. I, I got that. Away. Okay. But how is it that you terminate the pregnancy um, in general? I go to the doctor, the doctor does a procedure and I'm no longer pregnant. Okay. What is the procedure that he does so that you're no longer pregnant? Uh, how could you not be pregnant after the procedure? Well, I mean, the doctor goes inside and basically destroys whatever tissue or whatever sort of growth that's happening inside of me. Oh, okay. That's good. That's good. You're right. But the question is, um, what exactly is it that the doctor is destroying inside your uterus? All right. To end the pregnancy. All right. You call it tissue and some kind of growth. Okay. Here's my question. What kind of growth is it that is being destroyed? I mean, I know as from a Christian perspective, you all would say that it's life and all of that. And I mean, I guess. No, I'm not you know, saying from my perspective. I mean, just from yours, you're, you are destroying something. Is it alive? Yeah. I mean, I guess I'd have to say and agree with you that, yeah, it, it is. I mean, okay. I guess, I mean, I have heartbeat and all that. Right. Yeah. I mean. Oh, sure. okay. It's, if it's growing, it's alive. But you conceded more. You said what is growing has a heartbeat. Okay. <laughs> what could be growing in your uterus that has a heartbeat? I guess a child. Yeah. Okay. So when you say you want to terminate the pregnancy and get rid of the tissue, what you're saying is you want to take the life of the child that is inside your womb. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, I guess when you put it that way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sure. uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't the way I put it. That was the way you put it. Right. You use the word child, right? Yeah. Okay. So what you're saying is a woman should have a right to take the life of her own child when it's in her womb. Am I understanding you right? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, that's, I guess. That's okay, well, why, why would you think it's okay for a mother to take the life of her own child because of the reasons that you gave me? Well, if she's not feeling like she's fit to be a mom and the child would probably be worse off if she was the mom versus, you know, Terminating okay. it. Just, yeah. All right. I got gotcha. you. How could the child be worse off than being dead? Because your option is to kill the child rather than give birth to the child. How is killing the child better for the I child? Mean, I guess, it's, I guess, I guess if the okay, child never knows that a, a bad life you know, right, then. right. Let me jump in here and let's get out of the role okay. play for a minute. Let me explain yeah. what's going yeah. on here because notice that a whole bunch of the questions I asked were of our first step of the game plan. All right. Yeah. But I have an end game in mind.
because I know, and this is all, all of this stuff is in, in the book Street Smarts. The end game in mind is that there's really only one question that needs to be answered to resolve the moral question of abortion. It's actually quite simple. And that question is, what is the unborn? What is the unborn? And let me put it in a simple fashion. If the unborn is not an innocent human being, then no justification for abortion is necessary. You don't have to talk about choice and privacy and economics, as you mentioned. Have the abortion, remove the offending tissue. However, if the unborn is a human being, Notice this is an on or off switch, okay? It either is or it isn't. If it is an, an, an innocent human being, then no, no justification for abortion is appropriate because we don't kill innocent human beings for the reasons that people give for abortion, okay? So that's, my, that's the backstory here. And most of my questions to you, Jill, as Jill, Ellen, was uh, were, were to try to get at your... Um, understanding of what that was. Now, you actually, you know, were quite frank, frankly, admitted some things. And like, first you said tissue, then you said child. Well, that really helped me a lot. Okay. Right. But I have a way in the book of actually getting to that point, even if you're not willing to admit it, because that's simple science. All right. Is it alive? Well, nobody knows when life begins. Well, that wasn't the question I asked. Is it growing? How about that? Yeah, it's growing. Well, then it's alive, right? So you're trying to kill something that's alive. So what is it that you're trying to kill? And there are dialogues that I offer in the book to help get to this point of only one question um, and to help people realize there's only one question you have to answer. What is it before you know whether it's okay to kill it or not? Um, and then we start working on the particular circumstance. Now, there are a couple of more sophisticated challenges that pro-abortion folk um, will offer, and I go over some of those in, in the book, but it really comes down to strategically this one question, what is the unborn? And then tactically, we place those other questions in, in position so that people give these kind of common sense responses. Notice that a couple of times you said, well, when you put it that way, or <laughs> in those words, and I responded by saying, well, those weren't my words, <clears throat> right. those were your words. <clears throat> right. Okay. So she's Jill, in this case, is putting all the pieces in place that are common sense pieces mm -hmm. that lead to our conclusion. Now, yeah. it might be that at the end of this discussion that that uh, what the 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 person who's pro-choice will say is that I know it's a human being and I think it's OK to kill that human being for my convenience. Well, now at least you've flushed out the real issue. It's not sanitized anymore for them. And there are ways to deal with that even itself. But that gives you a little idea on the abortion question, how yeah. to proceed in a gracious way, simply asking these questions to get to the point where people can see that what abortion is doing is it's taking the life in a very brutal way. We might even ask people, well, what happens in abortion? What are the types of abortion? You know, they can yeah. scald it. They can chemically burn it they can um cut it up in pieces and pull it out piece by piece i mean it's pretty gruesome yeah. but uh that's what they're doing for their convenience yep and and you know guys one of the things that i always use in this type of conversation is i would you know come back and i would ask the person hey um if your child was two years old uh and you you know decided that you wanted to end the life of your two-year-old baby what would we call that um, in our society? And what do you think would happen to you as a mother if you were to end the life of your two-year-old? And unequivocally, people always say, well, that's murder. I would go to jail, right? And then you say, well, you've got them right then and there, because right there, they're, they're admitting that killing a child is murder, right? Outside of the womb. So then you have to try to <clears throat> get them to make the connection that, okay, so if you agree that this is murder, even the, when the child is outside the womb, then how right. can you come to a totally different conclusion when I've proven to you scientifically and just rationally that, you know, this is a life inside the womb? Shouldn't it be yeah, considered the right. same thing? <clears throat> Alan, perfect. That's perfect application. And uh, the thing is, <clears throat> even though we give, there's a dialogue that if a person's resisting, we can go to the DNA and all this other stuff, you know, uh, um, the fact is everybody knows Every woman knows that the that that which is growing inside her uterus is her own child. And that's yeah. why when when women talk to each other and one is pregnant, 
The other woman doesn't say, hey, how's your blob of tissue doing? When will the blob be delivered? You know, no, the, how's your baby doing? And right. they know when they have a miscarriage that they lost a baby. Right. And, uh, the, the, and the impact it's had on them emotionally is powerful because they all know this. And so we have common sense on our side, not only in this issue, Alan, but in a whole bunch of other issues. And this is why the questioning technique, the street smarts technique is so effective because these, these preparatory questions we're asking to lead up um, to the issue, to the conclusion, they, are, they're, they have common sense answers. Yeah. And if you ask the proper ones, and by the way, just doing well, I have the dialogues there in the book, but when you start doing this, you see, you get a rhythm, you, you start to understand how this works. And so even things that aren't covered in the book, you can, you can begin to unpack with the right kinds of questions. It yeah. just takes practice. That's all. Yeah. And it's actually very simple to do when you get the rhythm of street yeah. smart. Awesome. All right. So let's go into another, another uh, scenario. Okay. okay. My name is Darnell. All right. And I am a, uh, um, someone who is uh, of a different faith background mm -hmm. and I'm not a Christian. And so, right. um, you know, my question to you is, you know, Hey, I just believe that, you know, all beliefs, as long as you believe in God, you know, and you're a good person and things of that nature that you're going to, you're going to go to heaven. I mean, I think that that's mm -hmm. true. So how can you as a Christian be so arrogant to believe that you have the only truth in mm -hmm. all of the earth and that all of the other people who believe something different than you, yeah. we're all wrong and we're all going to die and go to hell. But no, Christians only have mm -hmm. exclusive rights to this truth and everybody else is like doomed to hell. Like to me, that's yeah. pretty arrogant. Yeah. Oh, I can see how you might think that, but just so I can get clear, Darnell, did I get it right? Darn Darnell. Is it Dar yeah. Darnell. Okay. Darnell. Um, so if I understand you right, you said that as long as someone believes in God and lives a right way, then they're going to go to heaven. Is that what you said? I mean, clarify that for, for me. Yeah. I mean, I just, I think that it's, it's arrogant to think that Christians have the only, that believing in Christ is the right. only way to get to heaven. Yeah, I got that part. I was talking yeah. about the previous thing. You okay, said yeah, what I believe that view, if you believe in, if you're a good person, you believe in God, good things, you believe in God. And be a, yeah. And, okay, so if you believe in God and you believe in, and you believe in being a good person, then that's what's going to get you. So that's your view. Yeah. Okay. In other words, that's your understanding about how people get saved. Yeah. Yeah. I, okay. I so in other that. words, in your own mind, if I understand you correctly, you have one way to God and that one way is believe in God and be good. Yeah. But that can happen in many different ways. In different, no, I understand beliefs. that. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm just saying you yeah. have one way. So yes. why doesn't the challenge of me being arrogant for thinking that I have the right way, why does that charge not also apply to you? because you just told me the right way that you think is the run one right way. Because my view is way more inclusive of people, you know, who can also be, go, be able to go to heaven. I'm not excluding anyone from being able to go to heaven. Okay. Well, you said you have to believe in God, right? That was yeah. one of your qual. Okay. So that excludes all atheists. Okay. All right. Okay. It also excludes people. When you say believe in God, do you mean believe in a personal God? God being the creator of, yeah, God okay, being so the creator be of the universe. God. So Hindus don't believe in a personal God. Buddhists don't believe in God at all. That's not even a feature of their religion. So they would also be left out based on the, that first criteria. Is that right? Um, yeah. I, I mean, I guess. I, I mean, I would say, okay. I would say, if people are really a good person, then God will decide whether they're going to get into heaven or not, as long as they're okay. a good person. Well, that's the other qualification, then really good person. What if I'm not so good a person? I mean, that's up to God. I think only God can tell whether I'm good enough to be able to go to heaven or not based on how I live my life. That's why I just try to treat people right and do the right thing. And, mm -hmm. and I, you know, God's going to decide. I might not even be good enough. Who knows? Oh, okay. Well, that's, Okay, that's interesting. I was going to ask you about that because you said I just try to treat people right. 
which means that maybe you don't always accomplish that. Okay. All I'm trying to point out now, Danielle, he gave me a hard name there. So <laughs> it's hard to remember. I'll just call My name is Jackson now. Jackson. Okay, Jackson. You are faulting Christians for thinking they were arrogant because they thought they had their only way. But it turns out you have your only way too. You have one way as well. And so now the question is, since we both believe that there's one way, the question is, which one is correct? Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. Okay, so now what we've done is, now I'm off the role play. Okay, what we've right. done is we've dealt with the arrogance charge. It turns out when people say Christians are arrogant for believing there's only one way to heaven, they have an understanding of of how to get to heaven themselves. That's why I asked the question. And you were you obliged so nicely and so great. So now I understand your one way. It turns out we both have one way. We both believe that our understanding of salvation is the correct understanding. Okay, now how do we break the tie? It's not arrogant, that's not the issue. And by the way, even if it were arrogant, is it possible for an arrogant person to be correct about his views, even if the person is arrogant? Mm, right. So sometimes I'll ask when they say that's arrogant, I said, I'm curious, why did you change the subject? Danielle Franklin, whoever you are. Jackson Darnell. Why did, why did you yeah. change the subject? Well, we were talking about who's, what's the right way to get to heaven. And now you're talking about my personality, which is my personality is arrogant. Okay, well, maybe I am arrogant. I mean, maybe, I hope I'm not, but is it possible I could still be right about some of my views? Sure, it's possible that arrogant people could be right. All right, then why do you think I'm wrong? in my view. And of course, now my question is directing to the real issue. It's away from the ad hominem, which is the character attack that they just offered me. Um, you're arrogant. Okay, well, whatever. Um, and it's now back on to the issue. <clears throat> so, I mean, if I said to them, once they said, you're arrogant, and I said, well, you're ugly, you know? <laughs> now, right, Man, that would I go would downhill say, quick, that. right, yeah. They yeah. would be nice, and it also is irrelevant, right. okay? Right. And just like, me being arrogant is irrelevant to the question. So I'm going to try to use my question to steer back to the main issue and then find out who's correct about this. How would you know? And that's another question I didn't ask you. But how would you know that uh, just believing in God and being good, whatever that means, that's pretty vague. And I'd want to ask some questions about that. Oftentimes, I'll come into uh, the Ten Commandments there, you know, and I say, okay, I'll just start working down the ten, see how the other person's doing. And I get through the first four. They haven't kept any of them, you know. Right. Keep going a few more. No, well, it doesn't sound like you're doing very good. But I could see how tactic number two would really help here, which is, hey, so how did you come to that conclusion, right? How did you come to the conclusion exactly. that believing in God and being a good person would get you in heaven? Can you tell me a little bit right. more about how did you right. come to that conclusion? And so now you're giving them a chance to explain how did they get to the place where they believe that. And That's then right. step three would be exposing the flaws, which would be, hey, so when you say good person, what exactly do you mean by that? And, right. and uh, how good do you have to be in right. order to get to heaven? And, and you know, how, does, so in your view, nobody can really know for sure, because even you said earlier that, you know, you don't know if you've ever been really good enough. Um, right. What does being good really mean? Explain that. And then next right. thing you know, they're just completely lost because... Now they now they're sitting there questioning whether their own methodology for how to get into heaven is even right because yeah and that's that's actually exactly uh, Alan that's what I'm after here too and I hope what your audience is getting is kind of a again a, a rhythm here of how these conversations go they're relaxed I'm, I'm dropping uh, I'm I'm uh, push, putting questions back to them that's giving me some breathing room here it's forcing them to think through their own issue more and like I said. Once a person has to answer questions about their view, um, it doesn't, you know, more flaws are evidence there and uh, become obvious and uh, and that their view doesn't look as good to them as they, they thought it did at first. And this is what we're trying to get them to do, just to think about that. Yeah. My conviction is that the Christian worldview, uh, Christianity taken as a whole, Jesus' understanding of reality um, is the best explanation for the way things are. Okay, it's, it's, it's as simple as that. And it uh, doesn't mean we don't have loose ends that we can't, you know, that we don't know how to tie up. Every view has loose ends, all right? Uh, because life is messy and our understanding of life and truth is, is limited, all right? We're trying to do the best we can with the information we have. And that's what this whole strategic 
tactical street smarts approach is meant to accomplish. Okay, we're going to do one last role play, guys, for the sake of time. And then I'm going to give Greg an opportunity to kind of tell you a little bit more about um, some special features as it relates to his book, his DVD, study guide and companion, things like that. We'll get into that in just a moment. But I'm going to give you the choice, Greg. Um, do you want to deal with the reliability of the Bible, having errors? Do you want to deal with how do we know if Jesus really rose from the dead? You as Christians base your whole belief on this idea of the resurrection. Right. How do we know whether that happened? Or do we want to deal with the idea of slavery in the Bible and how could your God condone something like that? I'll let you sure. pick which one. Since okay, this is your let, let's deal with slavery because this is a, a, a this is a, a huge hammer okay. on Scripture. But I want to give some background to this. Okay, okay. so uh, this is one of those those challenges that has some loose ends. All right, because it, it, it nothing's tidy in the Old Testament, and there's a reason for that. All right, and the reason is that. Um, I want you to think about Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, where he gave uh, a response to the Jewish leaders about um, uh, the issue of divorce and remarriage, all right? So um, he explains to them that God's intention for marriage is one man with one woman becoming one flesh for one lifetime. And by the way, that covers a whole range of issues right there. Okay, it covers it covers all the gender issues, uh, the the binary sexuality that marriage is between a man and a woman. It's for life, and that's where sex happens. All right, not outside of marriage. So there's a lot right there to apply to other areas. Um, but but um, notice that the 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 Pharisees say, well, why did Moses allow for a certificate of divorce if divorce wasn't God's purpose. Actually, they say, why did he command it, I think. Yeah, I command it, right. Yeah. The point, and then Jesus says, because of your hardness of hearts, right. all right? The, because your hearts were hard, God, through Moses, made a provision for something that's not the best. Not his idea. All right. That's yeah. really important here. When we go back to the Hebrew scriptures and we find things in the Mosaic law, God is managing a ugly circumstance. All right? right. And in the right. managing of a young, ugly circumstance, he is not coming to conclusions that comport with our 21st century ethical understandings. Okay. C.S. Right. Lewis called that. Uh, uh, so, how did he put chronological snobbery is what he said. We're reading back into 3,000 years ago what our more refined ethical understanding is now, okay? And a lot of that, by the way, has to do with a biblical ethic that has permeated Western civilization that motivated Christians to end slavery, which, by the way, slavery is all over the whole world for the entire history of the world, and it was Christians who saw to the end of it first in yeah. Great Britain and then in the in, uh, America. So um, that's because of the biblical ethic. So when we go back to the Hebrew scriptures, we have to keep this in mind. It's not a perfect situation, all right? right? Here's something else to keep in mind, is that I have in my Young's Concordance, which is keyed to the King James Bible, all right? You look up the word slave, you aren't gonna find it in the Old Testament because the word translated slave in, the, in our Old Testament uh, passages is the same word that's translated servant, servant okay? Yeah. Ebed, that's E-B-E-D, anglicized version, all right? In other words, it turns out that, that the King James translators all understood the, the existence of Ebed there, the occurrence of it, to describe servanthood not slavery, okay? Right. So I, my first question I ask people is, when you think of slavery, when you hear that word, what do you think of, all right? And what they think of, Alan, of course, is the American system. That's what we're faced with. It's our part of our history, an ugly part of our history, all right, where people were kidnapped on the African continent. Uh, then they were brought to this country. They had no rights. They could be raped. They could be beaten. They could be murdered at will. All right. Yeah, that's what you have in mind. Of course, that's what people are thinking when they see now in the more recent translations, the word Ebed being translated as slave. OK. And um, and so here's the then I ask him this question. Did you know that kidnapping is a capital crime under the Mosaic law? Yeah. Exodus no, 21. no I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Did you know that um, that murder is a capital crime under uh, Mosaic law? 
in Exodus 20. No, they didn't. So what, what I'm trying to do here is help, and I have the dialogues and all the information in the book. What I'm trying to help them to see is what they're thinking in their mind when they read the word slave in the Old Testament is not what the what the Jews were facing then, okay? Right. In fact, the way I like to put it is that um, in in under the Mosaic law, the Abeds, the so-called slaves, which are servants, uh, bond servants, it's sometimes translated, um, they had union representation in the Mosaic law. Moses was their union representative. In other words, there are certain things you could and couldn't do. You had to give them Saturdays off, just like everybody else. If you broke a tooth, you had to set them free, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was, there was a, a system in place that allowed people to have jobs. Now, this is hard for us to understand that uh, in, in our times now, but back then, virtually everybody was a servant or a slave of someone else you Danger. know yeah. uh, even the even the rich people were servants or slaves to the king or the emperor whoever it was um and in order to work and have a livelihood um people would indenture themselves for a period of years and they would get care and they would get feeding they would get protection and that kind of thing or pay off um it, you know, they, they never had in the American system, okay? Yeah. So it is a very different set of circumstances that were meant to control something that in the ancient Near East was really, really ugly and provide, make provision for people who could not make a living otherwise, including women, by the way, because if they weren't married uh, or they had gotten divorced, like Jesus was talking about in Matthew 9, um, they were, you know, kind of out on the limb. Who's going to take care of them? All right. And this gave them an opportunity to to uh, indenture themselves to someone else so they would have a way to be protected and make a living. And so it was a very, very different circumstance that we see in the Hebrew scriptures where the word slave is used than in the uh, in the New Testament or in, in modern times uh, in the American system, certainly. So yeah. that is an issue. That's one is still a little bit st stickier. But yeah. what we really want people to see is that this isn't the same kind of thing. Okay? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, guys, obviously we could go on and on. Um, I've got all sorts of other role playing questions, but I, quite frankly, guys, a, a lot of the role playing and the discussions and the sample type of discussions are found in this book. Um, as well as this book right here, all right? Uh, there's a variety of different conversations that are in both. So you're going to want to kind of pick them both up because they're kind of like, a, um, you, you know, you, you get this and you get this. But for right now, uh, you get this, you're going to be in good shape. So, Greg, uh, just one uh, couple of final questions here. Okay. Um, what would be your top resources, suggested resources for Christians who, yes, they want to use your questions, they want to use your strategy, but they also want to, they want to know what they believe. They want to be able to have some some answers ready for defending their faith. If somebody just came straight up and said, hey, why do you believe this? Forget your sure. questions. I want to know what is your reasoning? Maybe they're playing. Maybe they're using the tactics on us. Mm -hmm. Right. So what what would be some some recommended resources that you would say? Maybe give us like three or four that you're that you'd say, hey, you go to these websites or, or, or you know, to help us get girded up. Well, I'd say first go to our website as a starter, although yep. we're just one of many. And the organization that I represent is called Stand to Reason. We yes. just, this year's our 30th anniversary. So we've been around for a long time. We have so much stuff on our website, str.org. Easy, Good. Stand to Reason, str.org. Okay. Perfect. So lots of stuff there. And that's why they, they can listen to my own podcast, for example, and lots of stuff they can gain there. Um, I think Frank Turek and Norm Geisler wrote a great book called uh, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. A lot of evidences that are there. We mentioned Jay Warner Wallace earlier. His uh, his first book is really his one of his best and, and very important to establish the reliability of the New Testament documents, particularly the Gospels, the account of Jesus and the resurrection of Christ. Um, that book is called Cold Case Christianity. Uh, another book that's been around for 50 years and uh, just got a rewrite a couple of years ago 
Josh McDowell's evidence that demands a verdict. Uh, Sean, his son, helped him with the rewrite. But that's a fabulous book. It's almost like an encyclopedia yeah. uh, dealing with lots of different issues. Let me recommend one other. You mentioned Street Smarts and Tactics, the relationship there. Keep in mind that Street Smarts is a standalone book. So the whole game plan, the whole gardening concept, and why questions keep you safe, that's all in the Street Smarts book. But Tactics has a whole bunch of other stuff that will help. Um, so if they get the one, two punch is the best, but they can get street smart by themselves. But there's another book that I that I wrote, and I don't know if you even know about this one, Ellen. It's called The Story of Reality. Let me put it in. Okay, it's how the world began, how it ends, and everything important that happens in between. Uh, this was Christianity Today's uh, book of the year uh, in the evangelism category about three years ago or four years ago, and, and the Gospel Coalition, same thing there. The reason I mentioned this is because if we are going to give an answer for the hope that's within us, we have to understand the hope that's within us. And I think a lot of Christians, Alan, do not have a cohesive understanding, a coherent understanding of how all the pieces fit together. And so in this book, The Story of Reality, I start at the beginning, how the world began. I talk about the important steps in between, and I end at the final resurrection. So I start with God, and then I talk about man, then I talk about Jesus and the cross, and then the final resurrection. Try to put the whole piece together. And when you understand the big picture, Alan, um, people realize that the problem of evil is not a problem for Christians the way people think it is. It's yeah. a problem for atheists. And I actually talk about that quite a bit in Street Smarts. And I have a chapter called Evil Atheism's Fatal Flaw. It's mm -hmm. a problem for atheists, not for Christians. It's part, evil is part of our story. Our whole right. story is solving the problem of evil, okay? Right. The second thing that they'll understand with that book, um, Alan, is they'll understand why Jesus is the only way of salvation. Because singular problems, problem of evil, often have singular solutions, okay? Jesus being the only way. And you, once you get the big picture, you see how that all fits together in a really sweet, coherent way. In fact, when you see the big picture, it's so elegant that it itself is a, a, a defense or apologetic. It's a reason to believe the truth of Christianity. So right off the top of my head, those are the books that I would recommend. Final question. Tell us just a little bit about, I know you have a study guide, a DVD companion that will yeah. help people feel a bit more prepared. Tell sure. us a little bit about how you feel like that would help um, really get us as Christians kind of in, a, in the best place that goes sure. with your book. You can read the book and get the stuff, okay? Then people think, okay, I'd like my friends to know about this or my Bible study group or my youth group or something like that. So uh, it's hard to take the stuff in the book and then develop it into sessions that you can do with a group. Uh, some people can do that, fine. Most people can't. So we have a plug and play answer to that, and that's the DVDs. So I think the DVDs are like 10 sessions, and I'm the talking head there. I'm doing all the work. You can get the study guide that goes along with it. Okay, right there, Street Smarts uh, Study Guide, um, and uh, companion that with your group. Um, plug and play, make the coffee, meet together for 10 sessions, and there's the whole program. So people it. can interact. There's study questions and uh, um, interactive questions in the study guide that will help too. So those are ways to make transferring this information easier with your family, with your youth group, with your Bible study group or whatever. So uh, that's why we put all of that stuff together. The book's also available on Audible. I did the reading on the Audible. So if people are familiar with my voice, they'll hear me reading my own book, which is uh, which is kind of interesting. So I did that uh, I for my book. That is a labor of love and it uh, <laughs> it's worth it, but it, it sure, it takes a couple of days. And man, I it tell does. you, it's I, a lot I of was work. worn out. <laughs> uh, after I did that for my book. So, right. uh, Greg, this is awesome. I, mean, I am so very excited about this book. And I have a small group that my, my wife and I are part of at our church. And we're always looking for a series to go through, um, you know, with other couples and things like that. And I'm going to propose that we go through Street Smarts Great. the next time we have an opportunity to choose some curriculum, because I think it's going to really help us become more prepared. And I think mm -hmm. it will also allow us to have some good, fun conversations do right. some role play and things exactly. of that nature. So Greg, thank yeah. you so very much for being a guest here on The Beat. Uh, this was an amazing conversation. I know that Christians are going to get a lot of value out of um, the, uh, the the method of uh, just asking questions that you lay out so clearly in this particular video, as well as in the Street Sparts book. So guys, I encourage you to go get this. I'm going to put a link in the description so you can go check it out on Amazon and you can also support what Greg is doing 
So uh, go pick up this uh, this copy, of your own copy. And uh, any final words you want to share with us before we? Yeah, w- very quickly. And that is the most common comment I get from people who have uh, read the tactics or street smarts material is that this material changed their life. I hear this over and over again, and I'm flattered by that and humbled by that. At the same time, I'm not surprised because it changed my life too. And and people are amazed at how this has transformed their ability to have um, productive, easygoing, friendly, and effective conversations with people that challenge their own views. It's transformative. And I hope that that will be the same thing for your listeners as well, Alan. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Greg, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a good friend. And I look forward to doing more ministry with you together. And yeah, me we, too. Uh, it's traveling in similar circles. So guys, thanks so much for your time. And I appreciate you guys being here, supporting the channel. And uh, hey, we're going to have some more uh, interviews and guests on in the future. So thank you so very much. We love you. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. <laughs>